truly is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you uh, for this tremendous symposium. And I, I really have to give credit to uh, Dr. Huwais and his entire team for what he has done, what he has accomplished in su such a short time. And as you saw this morning, uh, we had a, a tremendous uh, foundation uh, already developed for us to set the stage for what now will be the, the clinical material that will follow. And I have the, the honor and pleasure to kick off the clinical session here this afternoon. And as an oral maxillofacial surgeon, I, my goal is to give you kind of a unique perspective of how this technology has impacted my private practice as well as my institute. I've been on board about 14 months now, and um, quite honestly, uh, none of this could have happened, certainly, uh, without the science that is there already and the science that is being developed. And in fact, uh, once again, I just am grateful to be part of uh, this tremendous cast of clinicians, our colleagues and scientists that uh, are presenting uh, from today and tomorrow, including the hands-on sessions yesterday. It's a privilege to be part of this group. But quite honestly, without uh, the, um, pardon me. So that said, uh, I am in private practice now for some 33 years. And as um, Mike mentioned, um, it's been uh, quite a, an interesting ride. I will tell you this, that I enjoy my practice now probably more than I have ever. Uh, time does go by fast, and I think I'm having more fun now than I have had ever. And the fact that I'm able to be an educator slash clinician, I'm still slugging it out four days a week because I enjoy it. And also I have the privilege of being able to be part of an institute and some academic affiliations as you see here. And now being part of so many clinicians uh, educational uh, backgrounds it's been just uh, an honor and a pleasure I had no idea things would develop to the point where we would be at 26 years plus and continuing the courses uh, that I have at the Institute So it's been fun. The uh, new uh, building that you just saw is just a few years old, and we've now had the honor and pleasure to be able to have all of our courses uh, in one campus versus being a bit of an itinerant uh, in the past. And it has been uh, quite a, a, a fun ride. And the whole concept for me, at least the premise that I have based my institute on and, and the teachings over the years, is that of a hybrid surgeon. And not to get into too much detail at all, but I think it's critical that we all embrace the, the concept of certainly, and it should go without saying, but developing skill sets equal with both bone and soft tissue. One without the other doesn't work. And this osteodensification technology really kind of brings things together as you're going to see the rest of today and tomorrow. Speakers that will follow me will have their respective niches in discussing these various areas. And in fact, again, at the heart of the of the Institute is single tooth and full arch reconstruction, but it's all about bone and, of course, soft tissue. Just one comment with regard to an individual who impacted my career more than anybody, and Salad already gave, paid tribute to this giant, and without question, each and every one of us in this room, one way or another, is connected to this man, uh, without a doubt, and I firmly believe that we will continue to play each and every day the music that he created long after his passing. And um, 
he will be sorely missed. All the images in my presentation have, none of them, I should say, have been altered or manipulated, and they're all of my own cases unless I specify otherwise. This is a tremendous technology that we have available to us today. It is one that has certainly impacted my professional career like nothing else. And without a doubt, it's a game changer. And I can tell you that it has made such an impact on my practice that for 14 months, I have literally not touched a vendor drill, zero. I placed four to five different uh, implants rather, from four to five different in in implant companies. But virtually these last 14 months, with I think maybe one exception, every osteotomy created is with this technology. And I can thank, I can thank one person for this. And without question, I give all the credit, all the credit to this man. And uh, he made me look at this despite me blowing him off for almost 10 months. And by the way, that's a high school picture, I think, uh, of him. He, when, when I asked him for a picture, he gave me his high school yearbook. So I, uh, at any rate, he didn't have hair then either. So, um, but seriously, he made such a difference. And I, like I said, I blew him off for almost 10 months. And finally, at one of the trades, he said, Mike, get over here. I got to show you that. I was embarrassed. He caught me sort of red-handed. So long story short, I follow him over to the booth. I drill in the porcine tibial plateau, look up and happen to see Pelo Quayle, Pelo Trezi, his name's on some research, and I, that was it. That was it. They had me at hello at that point because these guys are giants in the field that I've known forever and respect, and based on that and what, what Salah was telling me, the rest is history. So Salah, thank you so much for making such a difference in, in my career. Because it created a paradigm shift. That's really what happened. A tremendous paradigm shift. And, you know, we all experience these in our careers and our personal lives as well. And if I show you this photo, some of you may have seen this from Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. What do you see? Any, any of you see a young lady in the picture? Anybody? Look hard enough, you'll see the young lady. How about an old lady? You might see that as well if you look hard enough. So see, it's all about perspective. That's really what we see. It's dependent on our perspective. And what your mind is trained to see, it's a paradigm. And what is a paradigm? It's part of a paradigm shift. It's, it comes from the Greek word paradigma, which means pattern. The pattern we expect to see, which is what we have been used to forever. And as was shown so eloquently this morning, that instrumentation studies are like zilch for what we do. It's sad in dentistry. But the pattern we now see is something completely different. It is truly a paradigm shift for all of us, without a doubt. But you know what? Without science, none of this happens. And this morning, these gentlemen, and Rodrigo will fo follow me, have laid the foundation, the scientific foundation. They've given you the evidence. They've given us the evidence for what this is all about. Otherwise, it would be just what? Hearsay. In my hands, this works and that works. Doesn't fly. Of course not. So thanks to these gentlemen, we have science. And we have tremendous science that will continue to explode. The critical mass has not been reached yet. Not even close. So my goal in my time frame with you is to give you a surgeon's perspective of how this technology has impacted my practice. Now, I don't want to even think about covering science after what happened this morning, but I knew I needed to give, uh, at least to address a few, com a few items that are important and pertinent to any discussion, even if this were separate from this symposium. So with that said, just for a few minutes, I'll attempt to uh, again, not embarrass myself with regard to what's already been said this morning, but at least to present to you what's important to me as, as a surgeon. So, to drill or to densify would be the question, and basically the answer is we can do either or both, as has been shown with this technology. And again, the concept of osteodensification evolved over the years, as has been shown so nicely, but the key is for all of us is, again, primary implant stability. It's all about the micromotion as we've been shown so well. And so many things impact primary stability. 
And in our private practices, we've all done one or more of these particular items. Under preparing osteotomies, certainly. Depending on the aggressiveness of our implant, mac micro and mac macro texture. Using longer implants, especially in our full arch immediate reconstruction cases, in the maxilla in particular, where the so-called graftless solution is possible by avoiding grafts and therefore using long implants to engage basilar bone to get quote-unquote primary stability. And of course now we have the new technology which is osteodensification. And it is all about bone bulk as Salah has convinced me and really got me excited to be reading up more on the science of what goes on. And that bone bulk is really where it's at for all of us and that collagen integrity is certainly the key to what's happening. So, exciting as a clinician for me to look at enhanced healing and shortened healing periods, as Paul Rosen showed so well again this morning. I mean, how much better does it get for, for all of us? It's all about this bird technology, but like Salah said, it's really not about the drills. It's about the collagen in the bone, sure. It's about that hole and what happens to it. If we, what, treat bone that has such a tender texture, quote unquote, to it. It's, it's a very interesting, unique tissue. And it's not like we thought it was if we in fact looked at it as something very hard and cold. And the concept of controlled deformation is a very important one, without a doubt. Controlled being the key word here, the key descriptor. And that the viscoelasticity and the plastic plasticity of bone is where it's at for all of us. And how important is the irrigation element of no question. But here's the key thing. As surgical-based individuals, we can control the entire process. And this haptic feedback, which I'd never heard of before, is really a, a, an interesting and amazing and an awesome phenomenon. Because, because of this, this haptic feedback, we definitely are in control all the time of that osteotomy. But it was this article that really opened up my eyes and I read through this and I found Eric, and of course I'd already thanked Salah, but I found Eric and introduced myself um, and thanked him personally for co-authoring this particular article because this is the one that really made it all come together for me. And I'll just quickly uh, review a few things that made it so pertinent to me. and may well impact some of you that may still be somewhat um, on the fence, so to speak. I, I would hope not at this point. There, there's nobody in this room that isn't understanding with all the science that was presented how profound this technology really is and how clinically relevant it is. But as we know, the hypothesis was to basically prove this increased primary stability, bone mineral density, and percentage of bone at the inter implant interface would all be a result of the densification concept. And that we can, in fact, preserve this bone. It, it makes so much sense. It almost seems intuitive now. But of course, this after the fact that, you know, we've removed bone forever. I made my career on bone grafting. And I'd always remove it, <laughs> creating an osteotomy. I look back now, and I go, wow, ouch. You live long enough, you can look back and say, why was I even thinking that way? But, you know, it's all about change. And we have to embrace change. We have to understand that Change is just part of life, and it's a great thing. And when we see technology like this coming at us, my goodness, it's an amazing, an amazing paradigm shift for each and every one of us. So again, it's about collagen integrity, certainly, and without question, that strain element really intrigued me because I know a little bit about some crosstalk on a cellular level, having done a little bit of research uh, through Dan Spagnoli, who inspired me for some bone work uh, a few years back and had been part of my institute for quite some time. But the long and short of it is, it, it is about this, this strain element and, and it's so profound. And I thank once again, the clinicians uh, and scientists from this morning who presented what they did uh, and with regard to explaining that to us. But the fact that it's time dependent is really where it's at, as Salah and everyone else has talked about. And for me personally, as a clinician, Again, full-time private practice with the Institute as well. Uh, understanding bone better has made me a better clinician already. After 33 years of practice, I love to learn. I continue to learn. And this has just been an absolute impressive, awesome game changer for me. So that said, let's look at some 
clinical cases. And again, I've been chosen. So law asked me to pretty much give an overview of what I have done in my time with this technology, some 14 months roughly. I'm going to give you an overview of cases that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, let me proceed accordingly. This extraction site management uh, series, let's just look quickly at this particular molar. This patient asked me, Dr. Picos, you know, I, my neighbor just came to you and you were able to take his tooth out and you put a tooth right back in the same day. I want the same thing. Well, I looked at the radiograph and this cross section of the CT was like, are you kidding me? I'm not even sure I can put an implant in you anytime, Charlie. Um, well, long story short, I had a little discussion with him, and in cases like this, in cases like this, I pull out pretty much the bazooka. I'm very conservative with my incision design, which is basically flapless. And I like to, by bazooka, I mean something that's going to grow bone de novo. And the only thing we have today, at least in this country, is our HBMP2. Having done more than 450 cases at 10 years now, this works quite well. There's at least 14 different applications for BMP that I've found in my practice. This is one of them. When we have blowouts, not just one plate, but two plates are compromised in an extraction site, the only time I'll turn to BMP in an, in an, in an extraction uh, socket. So here we are at seven months. And seven months is a magic number for BMP. Any shorter than that, you will have a D3-4 quality bone. This is D2 pretty, pretty um, case to case to case. Now. This was done five years ago, so I'm not going to tell you identified here, not even close. But we grew great bone, took some histology, great looking bone, by the way. It should be bone de novo formation. It's a true mitogen morphogen. And as we know, transforms stem cells to osteoblasts, so predictable. And here's a four year follow up. We're actually almost at, we are at five years now, but that was at four years. And that's what we started with, and that's what we finished with. Now, What's that have to do with osteodensification? Well, guess what? Thomas comes back at four plus years and he's fractured the adjacent, the adjacent molar, the first molar. So now, and by the way, he understood quite well up front when I explained to him I couldn't put a tooth right back into that site. It would take some time. So it took seven months to grow the bone, another 10, 12 weeks for the implant and, and then his restorative. But now fast forward and he's fractured the molar. So we extract the molar. He's got a defect on the, uh, uh, yeah, one labial plate is out on the pellet. So basically, uh, I decided to um, not uh, place an implant simultaneously. We grafted him. In mineralized elder graft, I've used now for, gosh, 21 years, uh, 10, 11 years with one particular type, as you see here. Very predictable, very good turnover uh, without any particular. Um, um, bioactive modifiers involved at all. So here he is four months later. Now, I have the opportunity to really get a close-up on the implant I already placed, but also to densify the osteotomy. And this was really an interesting case because I was able to very nicely go through the sequence of events here with regard to step-by-step -step of drill sequence and got an insertion torque, as you see here, of 9-0. Now, before anybody gets too excited, and after what was said this morning, and I did have a brief discussion with Salah to make sure that I'm not up here as an outlier, because I guess I am to a degree, but I'm gonna show you quite a few cases with insertion torques from anywhere from 60 to 90. And the fact that we're densifying bone, in my humble opinion, is what makes the difference. And it's a gradual, by the way, I do step by step. I've not ever liked the Z, zigzag, whatever. I can't follow it. My retention span isn't so good. So I just go in a row from 2023, step, 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 all the way to almost the end. And in cases like this, it is a 5, 8 millimeter diameter implant. I stop typically at 5, 0. Sometimes I'll go to 5, 3 just to start the crestal osteotomy and then place the implant. At first, I tiptoed through because these insertion tours kind of spooked me, I'll be honest. But I took a step back and then just continued. And so far, I've had one failure in 14 months, and again, I'm in practice four days a week, I'm cranking a lot of clinical cases out, and I'm not even so sure what happened in that case, to be honest, but at any rate, um, it may or may not have been associated to my drill pr uh, protocol. But here we are with the follow-up, and we're now six months out with the first molar and five years on the second molar. 
But boy, I tell you what, it's a case like this that started to make me understand and appreciate better what the bone plasticity, bone elasticity, uh, control deformation started to make some sense. And you're going to see, again, others following me that will present in more detail cases like I'm showing you. I'm, again, giving you more of an overview. Here's immediate placement, a lower molar, where we're able to, again, densify the osteotomy quite nicely. And here we have a 70 Newton centimeter insertion torque, again, stopping at 5.0 and just going to 5.3, and the 5.8 fits like a glove. And again, clinically not an issue. Using autogenous um, materials, as you see here, a number of us have been playing with different types of, of tooth grinders, if you will. But uh, at any rate, being able to place the, uh, the implant uh, predictably and get a, certainly a predictable uh, outcome, uh, as we all know. And looking at still a different case, similar situation where we're able to extract and it's so important we get a purchase point. And I do like this Selvin starter burr because it's sort of like the Nobel Precision Burr. It's very sharp, rigid enough to just get that little purchase, and then we can go right to the pilot burr of the Versa series. And at this point, we're able to, again, create the osteotomy here, placing some, um, some Nova bone, and in this case, uh, about, what, 35, 40 Newton centimeter um, insertion torque. But, it's, but again, it's not just the insertion torque as has been explained so well this morning, but the stabilization of the implant certainly, and most importantly, creating an environment that is absolutely conducive, totally conducive to bone growth. Uh, here is the, the particular um, case that I'm showing you now in the posterior mandible. We've got um, typically a D2 quality bone. And in this situation, we had some marrow that was uh, rather... Um, uh, more D3 combination. We had variations of the theme, so to speak, but here we're looking at an 80 Newton centimeter insertion torque and some 70s throughout. Uh, but again, controlled deformation of bone, taking our time, expanding the bone as we need to. We know, we talk about standing on the shoulders of those that have preceded us. Again, the individuals this morning have laid it out so well. Uh, we've got basically the science to to validate what we're doing clinically. And I think that's so important because the clinical ramifications are so much more important than doing a study on a mouse where you're taking a molar out with tweezers and the implant is two tenths of a millimeter in diameter. Think about it versus the, the sheep studies that Paolo and Paolo were showing us that are up to what, a couple hundred pounds in, in size? They're more like us, I mean, certainly like me. So at any rate, um, and they're my cousins, by the way, so I don't mind uh, uh, referencing the boys. Um, so here we are with a, a narrow ridge. And again, you're going to see some tremendous cases that will follow um, by the clinicians that will present. But this really has made a difference for me as well, being able to expand bone, narrow ridges. We don't have to look at osteotomes, certainly for, for, for sure. And uh, we're able to still augment laterally as we know we need bone because in time we will get bone loss on the facial as we all know in time. So we'll do typically veneer grafting, which we've all done forever and uh, certainly works out quite well. But again, this really has made a big difference for me with regard to narrow ridges and how I treat them. Looking at the aesthetic zone, shifting gears, and again, you're going to see some tremendous material that will follow. But here's what I've been doing now with regard to osteodensification in the aesthetic zone. How many times we see young patients like this with congenitally missing lateral incisors. Some of them are very atrophic, require significant bone grafting for sure. Others, not so bad, like you see here. So here we're able to certainly uh, address these ridges with um, small diameter implants, 5-0. Um, and at the same time, in this case, again, showing the complete osteodensification protocol which again, for a 3.0 diameter implant, I'm, I stop barely at 2.3 and hold my breath because at this point, depending on what, that haptic feedback, because if I'm really pretty loose, I'm done. I don't need to go to 2.5, it makes no sense. So the 3.0 gives me, in this case, a 30 Newton centimeter, nothing wrong with that. Even 20 would have been fine. I'm not loading these guys. I'm not necessarily provisionalizing this particular case. 
But I am augmenting on the facial as we know how important it is for aesthetics. We know the story, the bone, the soft tissue. We like you know, certain minimal thicknesses to allow us to have long-term follow-ups that are predictable and still aesthetic looking, not just the implant being integrated as we know. So we're, we can predictably do cases like this. And here's a provisional, provisionalization of this patient, even at seven months. I have a very interesting clinician I work with. He's of my four or five elite dentists I work with. He's probably number one, Ed Hopwood, who um, will take his time and almost to a fault. But I love it because his cases are so drop-dead gorgeous. These are still provisionals at seven months. And there's the follow-up radiographs at that same time frame. Now, just to contrast to conventional 7 and 10 congenitally missing teeth, upper laterals, the 1, 2, and the what, the 2, 2. Here we are with a relatively thin gingival phenotype, certainly the challenge for all of us. And I don't see anybody in their right mind that would want to try to ridge split this case. I would hope not. Um, so... Cases like this, I'll tell you what, I don't do nearly as many autogenous bone block grafts as I had done in the past, probably the past eight to nine years. Uh, decreased significantly because of other ways of handling these ridges in a more conservative mode. But this is one where I'll take a Ramus buckle shelf block, split it in two, and it's as slam dunk for me as, as anything else that I do. And then particulate grafting with it as well. Uh, we know these things work. I mean, I know folks have challenged and have, um, have discussed this back and forth over the years, but uh, there's no question that they are predictable uh, when done properly, certainly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But using a combination of, of a composite graft, more or less, block particulate and some bioactive modifiers, here we are four months out, and we're able to visualize a post-graft scan, what things do look like before and after, and these volumetric renderings show dramatically the amount of bone that we do have, no guesswork with regard to what's there, simulating our abutment crown complex placement in each of the sites, and at this point we can create a, a surgical guide. Screw removal is very conservative, permucosal uh, removal, not a, not a big ordeal, but again, our guide is fabricated and uh, utilized, but in this case, we still need to what? Flap, although conservative envelope flap, no surface incisions, create our crestal osteotomy to get our good emergence profile. We close up, and if I showed you that as a completed case, you'd say, well, Mike, you know, wow, if that were my daughter, I'm not so sure I'd be excited because I'm, now, of course, this has blown up 100 times, but still, we've seen some punched out papillae here. Now, keep in mind, this is about six weeks post placement, it took about eight months, not seven years, but at eight months roughly, the papillae filled in. And of course, you know the story. Uh, we know all about the point contact to crest of bone. We know about interproximal height of bone. Uh, our colleagues, again, have shown us nicely, and Maurice will be presenting tomorrow uh, with some great work as always. Uh, and we know, again, from the literature quite nicely that even in a soft tissue phenotype patient, that these block grafts hold up quite well. And that's something that has been interesting that intuitively I've figured this out over the years, but these two articles validated that quite nicely. So pretty excited about that for sure. Now, I show that case, why? Because if I'm doing that case today with densification, I've got to be a little careful because at four months I'm re-entering these block cases in the maxilla. And you know, the complete bone turnover takes about what, 56 weeks in a human. We know that from Eugene Roberts' work. And quite, um, quite honestly, at, at four months, we've got to be careful. And the densification concept really makes sense to gradually expand our bone. And I've done that in a number of these cases, these block cases. Here we have um, a failing cuspid. And just to uh, share with you uh, something, that, a concept that will be elaborated on quite a bit more. I know by Dr. Campos, who's done probably more of this work than anybody I'm aware of. And Dr. Gluckman may well uh, address this, I'm certain, uh, as well tomorrow. Uh, but the bottom line is the, the socket shield um, um, approach is not a bad one to use. I was somewhat skeptical with it. I've only been working with it just under uh, two years. But I will tell you that um, my experience so far has been a very positive one. And uh, I'm very intrigued by the fact that we're able to hold that facial plate better than anything I've been able to do 
quite honestly, in all these years. And I say that uh, with conviction because, again, I was skeptical, like anybody would be early on with something new. But uh, as I found out, it works. It works. And Chuck Schweimer has done a ton of these as well, I know. Uh, it, it is a very interesting way to maintain that facial plate by just allowing for 95 plus percent of that root to be removed. Uh, and again, everybody has their own little protocol on how to do things. But here we are on a re-entry at four months. I had grafted this site and now going through step by step. And like I say, I'm pretty simplistic. This is a simple surgical brain that has looked at this. And I like to go 202325 step by step by step. That's just me. It's worked. It has worked. And I can't imagine it wouldn't work based on the science, again, that I've been privy to. So here we are with, uh, again, an insertion torque of uh, 40 plus Newton centimeters, able to place our implant. We can use some Nova bone. We can use a number of things, uh, different items, different materials. We all have a little bit different protocol with regard to how to handle these cases uh, from autogenous tissue to allografts to even alloplasts. So we can do that. We can do that. And we can use some other uh, materials, of course, as well. But the long and short of it is it's predictable. The knock on this, as I know will be addressed uh, later, is that, yes, in fact, you can have a tooth, a root fragment uh, become loosened. But, boy, that's, it's all about protocol like anything else. So uh, the complications that are associated with this procedure will be addressed, I'm sure, way better by those folks I mentioned already that will follow me. Another anterior case where eight and nine have been uh, extracted, grafted, and now we're re-entering. And we're able to, once again, use the same densification technology, place these implants very predictably with, as you see here, uh, some uh, insertion torques uh, that are 60 uh, Newton centimeters or so. Um, without a doubt, very predictable in my opinion. Uh, I've just thoroughly enjoyed being able to work with these burrs uh, over time now. Uh, the entire concept of bone biology uh, really has, uh, has changed for me as I've begun to research uh, these articles more and the references from these articles and be able to appreciate even better what truly this is all about. There's so much more to it than we could possibly imagine. And again, I appreciate what's, what was presented this morning because it's so much was needed. And I give credit for Salah for laying out the entire blueprint for these two days because that science really did lay the basis, the foundation for all the clinical work that we're doing. So again, we're able to sequentially uh, work with, as you see here, the pilot burr, followed by the 2.0, then the 2.3. These are going to be 3.8 millimeter diameter implants. So I'll be stopping at 3.0. And Salah talked about a 0.7 being the upper limit to uh, the difference between the last burr and the implant diameter, I think another tenth of a mil millimeter doesn't you know, certainly clinically make a difference. At least it hasn't so far for me. So again, we're able to uh, densify the osteotomies and then place our implants uh, accordingly and be able to get, again, a very predictable uh, outcome. Don't have to worry about burning bone. That great study, that wonderful study that, again, I would recommend all of you to read if you haven't. Read it from front to back. Digest it. Reread it. It's a great classic, in my opinion, that explains everything so well from a biological basis on, on what it's all about, how we should do this, why we're doing it, and most importantly, the clinical outcome uh, being so what? Predictable. Even the heat generated was only a few degrees increase in centigrade. I mean, not a big deal. Not, clinically, n not significant whatsoever. So when we look at that, we think, wow, if that is true, then so many of our cases, are you kidding, where we would take bone away after we just grafted? Why would we want to remove it? It's just so paradoxical. It really is, and hypocritical for that matter. So again, we're able to place our implants as we need to predictably into grafted bone. And yes, we can, we can graft um, our, on the facial. We veneer graft. I'll use these little um, porcine non-cross-linked membranes that um, have some stretch, basically like a bioguide type membrane that will allow us to uh, veneer graft and contain the graft uh, at the same time. Uh, we're able to do that quite predictably 
I've done veneer grafting like this, similar to this, not always with membranes though, in the aesthetic zone for uh, more than 14 years now. So having cone beam CT technology for 10, 11 years, I'm able to follow up and see, are these veneer still there? Are the grafts still there? The answer is yes. But we're using what? A xenograft in these cases. And you can mix that with a mineralized graft or some other graft in a 50-50 mix, either one. But I've shown that both work. And this becomes a mineralized matrix that buffers and contains, or rather I should say is self-contained within that flap. Uh, one even doesn't have to use a membrane as I'm showing you here. But this is, these are the membranes flapped on, and we just now reposition them and tuck them no fixation necessary. Apically, we only need it with the healing abutments, uh, as you see here. So, at any rate, that's just another aesthetic zone uh, situation that we can use densification in. And still, just another one where this had been grafted already with a PTFE membrane particulate, uh, as you're seeing right here. Uh, this is the case went out seven months. The membrane had been removed a little prematurely due to a small infection. So, this reentry is not showing you the membrane. But we've got great bone uh, bulk to begin with. And again, great insertion torque values for implant placement, uh, as you see here. Now, this brings us to a little different section that is going to be addressed in, in a different fashion uh, by Ziv. Uh, he's going to do a, another phenomenal job with regard to the work he's done uh, with Salah with regard to the crestal approach. Uh, for me, I've been primarily a lateral uh, approach person uh, for sinus grafts now for um, a number of years. In fact, for most all of the years I've been placing, done now over 1,100 of these grafts, of which only a handful have been crestal, but I'm tiptoeing more towards understanding and appreciating the crestal approach with, again, this technology. But what was exciting for me early on was to just see the impact of something like this, where I'm placing an implant using a lateral approach, but I wanted to just freeze this, which I did, got, a, got this was actually taken from a video, um, you can imagine, and you can appreciate the bone just basically being dispersed in a centripetal manner, as has been explained again so well, and that's exactly what these burrs do in that counter um, uh, direction, in, in, in the uh, reverse direction. So in fact, the densification is occurring laterally, but also apically, and there it is, proof of concept, where the bone is just basically blowing right into the, into the sinus. So we're able to, of course, elevate the membrane, create our osteotomy, and ultimately get an, an insertion torque of 60 newton centimeters uh, for this particular um, implant. And we're out now eight months of follow-up post-prosthetic completion with this particular case. So this gave me some confidence with regard to being able to really make sure I've got some great insertion torque values for placing implants simultaneous with my sinus uh, grafts, lateral approach, no less, Here's a small 4.7 millimeter um, uh, height ridge, residual bone height, or RBH, as, as we uh, have called it. And here I'll just show you this little video with regard to uh, the sequential steps that I used from, again, the pilot burr to what I call the dirty dozen here, and going through them in sequence. <laughs> here we are with the 2.0, and I'll bore you with this because there's a method to the madness. And uh, you can look at your cell phones for a while if you like, but um, basically uh, there's the 2-0, checking of course opposing occlusion to make sure we're, our path is correct. And now the 2-5 and the 3-0. And these are all reverse mode. And there's 4-0. Four three, four point five. Now there's five zero. So you can see what's been shown again, and you'll see again many times from clinicians they're going to follow me. But that that white ring is what we've been talking about from the morning. That's the densified bone. And that's a comparison of two other cases I've done with conventional drills, just conventional compared to the osteodensification technology and protocol. So that, to me, 
I think really is enough evidence, so to speak, with regard to you know, what does go on clinically, what goes on with the bone. So we compare, and of course we can go about our grafting, and we all have our different protocols with regard to what we um, utilize within the sinus. Uh, I've liked mineralized delta grafts and xenografts combinations for a number of years, using biocter modifiers more recently with regard to um, uh, what you see here. But now, let's look at placing the implant. 5.8 millimeter diameter, stopped at 5.0. There's 20, there's 30, there's 40. At this point, my assistant's getting nervous. I'm going to wreck the handpiece and everything else. So she's trying to hand me the, the torque wrench a little sooner than I would want to get it. And here it is. And it's almost like putting a lug nut on a car. It's 80 Newton centimeters. And um, quite stable, I would say, without question. And here's a five-month follow-up. This individual, lack of money, doesn't want a crown just yet. He's about seven months out. I'm ready to pay for the crown just to get him restored. And I probably will do that, quite honestly, just to have him in my database because I'm following so many cases now. At any rate, still another situation where, again, I know Ziv would drool at this and go, we're going to go Crestal. I'm sure of that. And he's going to show some incredible stuff, by the way. Um, so... Again, our lateral approach, very straightforward. And again, for those of us that have done these in our sleep, you know, we do them rather quickly. It doesn't take that long, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is, you know, we can certainly open things up. And if there's any doubt in the crestal approach, as you know, if there's a perforation of the membrane, then you need to go laterally. I don't think there's any question about that. And we have different techniques, as I'll show you in just a bit, to handle perforations from small to complete perfs, no question, not even uh, a discussion. But this case was done conventionally. This one, just to show you contrast, yes, you can get primary stability. I've been doing it forever, yes. But way more confidence now being able to densify these osteotomies. And here's still another one where, again, we can begin to create these osteotomies and almost begin and look at a crestal approach because we can eyeball at the 3 diameter number. I can, if I can now see the membrane, I feel more comfortable for the first time because I'll be honest, I have never been a big fan of the crestal approach because can't tell if that membrane's perfed or not. And the one problem I really have with the Crestle approach, and it's not the Crestle approach per se, it's some, and I say that, only some folks who are out there teaching this technique. The problem I have is that they're saying that, quote unquote, you only need to learn this technique, you never need to know how to do a lateral approach. Now, to me that would be analogous, to, okay, we go in for a gallbladder, serious gallbladder attack, right? Emergency or appendectomy. Odds are, you're going to leave that hospital with probably five or six little puncture holes. Same day, not a big deal, right? However, one out of ten of us may leave with what? The old proverbial scar opened up, stitches, the whole bit. Would you want your surgeon to not know how to do an invasive procedure and only know the endoscopic approach? Are you kidding? Of course not. So, I mean, for what it's worth, that's an issue for me. And don't get me wrong. This is the tremendously predictable way to go now, especially with this technology, and I've now been tiptoeing through this, and thanks to Ziv, who's helped and impacted so many clinicians, has had an impact on me as well. Uh, this one, I did have a perf, and therefore opened things up, as you're seeing here, and what about my normal lateral approach? Uh, again, with great insertion torques, not an issue with these particular implants that were placed. And looking at just a little bit different one here, as you see, again, lateral approach, where we're using uh, the, the technology in a smaller, this is maybe two plus millimeters of bone, where in the past I'd be a little nervous about getting stability with the implants, even doing a lateral approach. Well, guess what? The reality is here, I'm way more confident with this technology. And by the way, just a, a comment with regard to the width of the ridges in these sinus cases. You live long enough, you get to see your own stuff come back, and especially old cases. And I can tell you, having done so many sinus grafts, that following some of them at the 20, 21, 22 year mark and seeing, seeing facial plate dehiscence, some periimplantitis elements, et cetera, why? Well, those ridges were really thin. I didn't know any better in the day. So there I am placing the implants. We've all experienced that, those of us that have done this long enough and know that we'd see sometimes translucency of the implant of the threads at the ridge and go, wow, oh, I made it. You know, got it in there close up, 
Fast forward 10 years later, and especially if you don't have attached tissue there, what do you think you're going to see? I've seen enough of my own. Horrified, horrified for sure. It's like pilings at low tide. Boom. The abutments are showing. May or may not have periimplantitis, but you've got what? Facial plate loss. You bet you do. And um, what our colleagues have shown us quite nicely, um, Daftari in particular, uh, and, and um, blanking on his colleague, his cohort, who co-authored several articles. Bahat, thank you. Bahat and Daftari showing us how facial growth does continue, of course, all the way through adult life. So therefore, and, and by the way, that resorptive pattern is certainly, as we know, facial to lingual, facial to palatal. So therefore, my approach in the past 10, 12 years has been I'll graph for three to four millimeters of width back there, not two, four. Why not? So for me, the crestal approach, in my opinion, would be contraindicated in the thin ridge case where I know I have to open up, do my lateral approach, and now I can augment facially all at one time. And it's not an ordeal, uh, not, not a big deal. But that's just, again, my comments, my um, two cents worth on that approach. And again, we have perforations. Of course, we deal with them, as you see here. And some of these membranes, they're 0.3 to 0.8 millimeters in thickness on average. What's three-tenths of a millimeter of a membrane thickness? What does that e equal to? Eggshell membrane, really thin. You look at it the wrong way, you cough or sneeze, and it's gone. No one seems to talk about these that are just so thin, especially in an edentulous situation. They're super thin. They're going to tear on you. And when we have pathology, as I'll show you in a second, how do we handle these cases? Well, it's not that difficult. Uh, for almost 20 years now, we've been able to use a um, collagen membrane technique with external tack fixation. This is a cross-link membrane that adapts itself quite well. Sometimes we have to splice two together because the sinus is so large. But quite honestly, over 1,100 sinus grafts later, I've not aborted one sinus in all these years because of this technique. And it's just a, a straightforward one that uh, we developed uh, quite some time ago. And it's straightforward, but the key is leaving that membrane with about 8 to 10 millimeters of bare bone Y. We need bone, we need, uh, I should say, we need blood supply from those walls and from the floor to nourish that graft. And in fact, that's what happens. An infection rate is no different than if the membrane is intact. I've shown that in my own work. But here we are, once again, using uh, osseo densification technology, great insertion torque values, five-month follow-up, no issues of any type of bone changes, even with these insertion torques, nothing, nothing. This is set up for a partial uh, denture. Now, if I showed you this Panorex, and it's really just a screen, it's a straightforward panel, and to, well, let me just make a, I'll ask a rhetorical question. Does anybody see anything on this panel of significance other than some obvious things like some bone loss around these molars and perhaps something going on down here? Anybody, just think for a second, look for a bit, and keep in mind that panorexes are so deceiving, as we know that this technology is so outdated, it goes without saying that three-dimensional work is where it's at, and obviously we've all embraced cone beam CT technology, but quite honestly, uh, if you're not sure uh, about that, you would be very sure here uh, in terms of what's in that sinus. And in fact, we look at it even better, and even better with all these sections that we can appreciate that, yes, in fact, we have what appears to be a mucus retention cyst, a large one. Not one of these little guys that you can elevate, get out of your way, not obtain the osteomedial complex and go about your business. This is a big boy. So you have some choices here. You can certainly refer this to an ENT physician. No problem there whatsoever. Or you can deal with it yourself. And in this particular case, uh, I chose the latter. And I enjoy doing these cases because uh, they are uh, out of the ordinary, make the day a little bit different uh, and exciting. You're obligated to remove the entire membrane in these cases, by the way. Not up to the inforbital uh, floor, but at least seven, eight millimeters or so away from that. In other words, we want those bony walls and floor intact, but most importantly, the membrane feeds this, this pathology. So you've got to remove it. You've got to remove it. And that's the medial wall, by the way. So again, we, we handle this quite easily. Um, with, as, you know, as I've shown you already. But interestingly enough, and this is no disrespect to any of my colleagues, I know all these folks quite well, 
But the literature is clear on what we do with these cases, and that is what? If there's pathology, remove it, close up, and come back. And we're talking by pathology, I mean cysts, mucus retention cysts, pseudocysts, and go on and on. Unfortunately, literature is not clear on what cysts are all about. But we're talking benign entities. And also, if there's a large perf, then we should close up, put a membrane over the window, and come back and pick a number. Four months, six months, nine months have a baby, come back and you will still not have a membrane. I can tell you that from too many cases on re-entries of my own and others. So the bottom line here is, and by the way, that was chapter eight, there's chapter 10. I have to be right in the middle. Didn't even realize that until a few years later. And I've been harping this forever. Don't need to abort these sinuses. The membrane technique works quite well, as you see here. So at any rate, what's this all about? We're able to get primary stability, of course, with our osteodensification approach. Not in this case. This happened to be an older case. Uh, I won't bore you with the, um, with the video, but the long and short of it is 10-month follow-up, and here we are with the implants in place and a five-year follow-up where our bone is still very much alive and well, and we're actually at almost seven, almost eight years now, uh, and we'll need to get our little gal back for follow-up. Looking at the crestal approach, you know, we can certainly bump up, and I'm conf confident and comfortable with just three millimeters or so at a time, like Salah has said, and certainly Ziv. Uh, these, these kind of cases where you have maybe five or six millimeters, and you can go three millimeters through the crest, uh, I've been doing these pretty routinely and, and been, be, have become comfortable with them. Uh, they work uh, quite nicely. And yes, I like the idea of using this particular graft medium, which is the only time I really use an alloplast, uh, quite honestly. But um, the Nova Bone uh, does, does work well here. And again, implants are able to be placed, uh, as you see. And a three-month follow-up on that. And still one other case here, which really has nothing to do with the sinus, but I'm showing it only because you're in for a real treat uh, with um, what Robert Emery is going to share with us tomorrow uh, with regard to this uh, navigational technology. It's, it's a very impressive one. I've uh, been involved with it now for about two years. January, in fact, this case I did January of 2015, almost to the day two years. And uh, was, a, I believe, the first case done outside of Rob's office. He and his partner have done so many, and now there are quite a few clinicians. Over, I believe over 7,000 uh, implants have been placed uh, throughout the country, throughout the world, uh, with this, um, this particular uh, navigational technology. And it's, it's a very uh, impressive one, uh, to say the least. And uh, you're going to, again, hear from him in detail. And Robert just happens to be a pretty brilliant man uh, in and of himself, apart from oral maxillofacial surgery, but he's a great surgeon and clinician as well and has a tremendous grasp of the technology. He's going to share with us some very, very intriguing uh, material as it relates specifically to osteodensification. And just a few cases to su summarize things up with regard to more application in my practice. The grafting that we do with Timesh in particular and our BMP2, as I alluded to earlier with just an extraction site, uh, there are ridges that will build up certainly um, with this same approach. And um, here we're able to quite nicely grow bone, grow it well, predictably. Uh, it's bone out of a bottle, so to speak. And I know some of you are in countries that uh, this is not uh, acceptable yet. It's not um, uh, quite received in terms of being able to uh, quote unquote legally uh, utilize it, but this particular growth factor is an impressive one, RHBMP2. Uh, there's, there's some very nice work being done on, on uh, a related uh, cousin, first cousin, if you will, to this that I'm indirectly involved with right now that's going to be even more exciting, I believe, um, that's coming down the pike. But at any rate, um, this is predictable. And when we re-enter this at seven months, again, it's a D2 quality bone. Uh, very, very predictable. And we're able to, once again, utilize the concepts that we've been exposed to in terms of maintaining that bulk bone, uh, taking advantage of the plasticity, the elasticity of bone, and placing our implants uh, into these grafted sites, conserving the beautiful bone that took seven months to grow. Again, why would we want to remove it? 
So, you know, here we are uh, able to very nicely um, revisit the surgical site and um, full flap reflect this. And those of you that um, are not too familiar with time mesh or have used it and, and had not good results with regard to dehiscence, there's several nice strategies that we all utilize now uh, that uh, really minimize exposure of mesh. And by the way, if mesh does get exposed, it's very kind to the tissues after two weeks. You can nurse these exposures right to the seventh month. But, and how difficult is it to take the mesh out? Not very difficult at all. That's another knock on this approach. It's really not difficult at all to remove it uh, as a rule. So here we are with the bone. And again, we're able to now create some, some crestal anatomy. I like this large round fissure burr for this particular application to get, again, a, get some interdental bone and create some nice, some nice emergence uh, profile for our, our implants, certainly. And again, going through our typical protocol um, after our starter burr, going right with the pilot and through the entire Versa um, sequence, as I've shown you. And here we're able to very predictably, very nicely into this grafted bone, by the way, completely grafted at seven months. And this is, uh, again, a combination of BMP2 and mineralized allograft. That was the only, those are the only two um, items that were used together. The mineralized allograft only there for bulk, by the way, because BMP2 with the liquid on the sponge is really a horrible matrix. It's not a good scaffold. So it needs space. It needs space, otherwise bone will not grow. The mesh will maintain space, but within that we need a filler. To me, the mineralized allograft makes all the sense. And that's what I've used now for more than 10 years with this protocol. So again, we're able to densify the bone very nicely. And um, again, create the osteotomies physiologically. See, this is the key for all of us. It's physiologic osteotomy preparation more than anything we've ever been exposed to. And I think you'll agree, again, based on the science that we now know, it's just an amazing technology that gives us the opportunity to create a beautiful environment for these implants. And we're talking 25, not so bad. Keep in mind, this is grafted bone. And that's, that was a 3.8 millimeter diameter for the cuspid. This is a 3.0 for the lateral. And again, we're off and running. And we're able to very predictably, again, place these implants with confidence, good insertion torques, uh, et cetera. And, um, you know, without a doubt, we uh, are comfortable with, with the protocol, certainly. Now, just to close out some comments, and I know Jack Krauser is going to very nicely address uh, this tomorrow. Uh, Jack has done quite a bit of work uh, in this area. Uh, with regard to full arch reconstruction, immediate reconstruction, uh, my work has been primarily based on guided, on guided full arch. And by guided, I mean not just guided for the implants, but guided for the prosthesis because that prosthesis is fabricated in advance for a number of the cases, about 85 to 90 percent of the cases I do. And, and so what I'm saying is we have a prefabricated PMMA bar supported prosthesis that is delivered at time of surgery. But keep in mind now that the surgery itself is guided completely, including the ostectomy. And as, and as Salah pointed out so well, one of the red flags of this particular technology is what? Guided surgery. So we've got to be really careful if we're going to use guided surgery because, quite honestly, uh, I have actually gotten to a point where in this, a few of my cases, so I've been able to remove the guide and still go in with the burrs and try to densify as best I can and, and then reposition all the hardware because in the particular uh, protocol that I follow, uh, there is a surgical guide that is placed over the bone after the teeth are taken out, and it is, it's not, it's actually, it's a bone foundation guide, pardon me, that stays there to the bitter end. And it's a stacked system. Once the ostectomy is done, a surgical guide is pin indexed into that foundation guide. So that said, you've got to be careful removing hardware. But my point is, um, I have been able to more easily adapt this technology to the cases that I do freehand. And again, Jack's gonna address this quite well. Um, no question that um, although this is a mandibular case, uh, we don't need to necessarily 
I say that with tongue in cheek, use, that, uh, use these birds here, but sure, why not? We use them everywhere else. We may as well here as w also. So we're able to densify the bone even in the mandible, why not? But guess what? I'll use more of a clockwise in addition to counterclockwise approach here, obviously, because of bone density. And once again, the control is within our own power. See, this is the beauty again, one of the many beautiful things of this technology. We can control these burrs with what they do. And in turn, the burrs will dictate to the bone the preparation. So we're being kind to this very dynamic tissue which again, Salah has shown so beautifully and all the other clinicians and scientists that presented uh, this morning as well, and Rodrigo is gonna follow me. The bottom line is the science is there. We know we can safely do these cases and increase our predictability. And that's really important because how many cases do we have, and I'm sure Jack will address this by comparison, in terms of conventional approach, especially in the maxilla, versus densifying the same osteotomies. Because it's not always about what, engaging basal bone necessarily. So the way I see it, there is a paradigm shift within a paradigm shift of just this clinical application in the maxilla, I believe. And Jack, I'm sure we'll, I've just handed the ball off to you and you're gonna take it and I know, run. And I look forward to your presentation tomorrow. So basically, we can use these burrs from single, art, or from single tooth situations, certainly, to full arch reconstruction and of course everything in between. And that's what I've attempted to share with you during my time with you uh, this morning or this afternoon. And again, those clinicians that are gonna follow me are gonna each have a respective niche to share in more detail the different sectors that have clinical application once again uh, for this uh, technology. So, in summary, basically, I could stand up here all day and, and just be so excited about this that um, if you haven't guessed already, it has made such a change for me in my career that uh, I could literally spend hours now explaining you in more detail so many other pluses that this technology has afforded both me, my practice, and, and my institute. My staff can tell you how excited I am each time we do cases. I mean, they... In turn, it's contagious. They get excited, I get excited. We're all pumped up. And once again, I give all the thanks to Salah and his entire crew for what they've done, what they've established, the entire scientific board. Uh, the, the fact that we have this, this evidence is just absolutely um, an amazing technology. And I, again, I give you thanks, Salah, so much. Just a couple comments with regard to a plug for some upcoming courses that uh, Maurice, who's again presenting tomorrow, he and I, this is the eighth time we get together every two years. We do our little thing, and it's an interesting format because we're at the same podium, same time, all three days, going back and forth over bone and soft tissue ad nauseum. So uh, this same venue, uh, in, this will be in June. And then last but not least, in November, uh, we are having a full arch immediate implant reconstruction uh, symposium that's three days of, uh, these are just some of the clinicians that have been invited. There are uh, three more, uh, Christian Koshman being one uh, non well, non-clinician material he's going to show, but basically right at the heart of full arch implant reconstruction that will be, I think, a, a, very, um, a very unique um, setting for uh, what we have to share with you. So you may want to think about attending that. That's, again, in this same uh, location at the Ritz-Carlton. So with that said, another reason that I like to continue to practice, and I'll close out with this, and it's because, A, I enjoy my work. I love it. I'm having more fun now than ever before, especially because of technology like this. But I also happen to have two children, uh, adult children now, that are going to be entering my practice. Uh, this is Lindsay, who's sitting in the second row here, is probably turning red now completely, um, that's finishing up her perio program with uh, Dr. Neva at UF. So she'll be joining us in practice. And Tony, the giant, Greeks don't usually get that tall. He skipped a generation on my family tree, 6'3". Um, uh, he's finishing up dental school at MUSC in Charleston and will going, be going into perio at UAB Birmingham. So three years later, he's to uh, join me as well. So see, I. I did well. I'm an oral surgeon, and neither of my children went into oral surgery. Um, so at any rate, uh, I thank you once again so much uh, for being part of this, uh, allowing me for, to be part of this symposium. Thank you for 
being here, taking time out of your busy schedules to be here for these days. And again, you're in for a, a real um, beautiful rest of today and tomorrow with the clinicians that are following me. Thank you so much.